Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia and welcome back to episode 5 of Let's Talk Lore, a princess series. Before we proceed, I want to get the bad news out of the way first. This series will be taking a break over the weekend as planned. It will resume at its regular time at 8pm Eastern Standard Time next Monday and will be updated daily till its conclusion on August 7th. So sadly, y'all have to wait two days to scratch your history itch. But the good news is that there will be the Reform Guide series, which will continue over the weekend as planned. So if you play the game, then please enjoy those in the meantime. If you're here strictly for the history, then the silver lining is that this episode will be an extra long episode to last you for the next few days. Alright, let's get started. Last episode, we saw Empress Jack kill two birds with one stone and then proceeded to throw away the stones well. With the regent Yang Jun, Empress Dowager Yang Zhi, co-regents Sima Liang and Wei Guan, and the hot-blooded fool Sima Wei all out of the way, Empress Jia took full control of the kingdom and ruled in Emperor Sima Zhong's name. And for the next eight years, she proved to be a capable ruler and the kingdom prospered. But in the year 299, an old curse comes back to haunt Empress Jia and this temporary peace will shatter and the kingdom will once again become engulfed in war on a scale unseen since the days of the Three Kingdoms. But before we can talk about the downfall of Empress Jia, we must first introduce a new prince to our story, Zhao Wang Sima Lun. Sima Lun is one of the eight princes. He was the ninth son of the legendary Sima Yi, thus making him the grand uncle of the emperor. So far, he has been missing from our story, so let's first catch up to what he's been up to since the beginning. Sima Lun was granted the title of Zhao Wang, or the King of Zhao, in the year 274, and was assigned the land that included the famous ancient city of Ye in northern China, where he was tasked with the simple task of maintaining the peace with the many northern nomadic tribes that have already sworn vassalage to the Jin. However, despite being the son of the legendary Sima Yi, Sima Lun was a terrible student in his youth and instead took a great interest in superstition and witchcraft. In the year 291, the same year that Empress Jia took power, due to his poor administrative talents and decisions as the regional king, two of the nomadic tribes rebelled against the Jin and Sima Lun was summoned back to the capital to receive his punishment. Once at the capital, however, Sima Lun quickly bribed and sucked up to the Empress Jia and her mother, Guo Huai, and thus was spared from any punishment and was instead named to become the new grand tutor to replace the now deceased Wei Guan to educate the new crown prince, Sima Yu. For the next eight years, Sima Lun remained in cohort with Empress Jia and eventually rose to become the general of the left responsible for the capital's defenses. While this was all great news for Sima Lun, we also need to talk about what happened to his now abandoned land of Zhao. Although Sima Lun retained his title, he never took another step in his given land. Instead, in the year 299, Chengdu Wang, Sima Ying, was sent to garrison Ye and take care of the nomadic threats from the north. This is also the first time we heard about Sima Ying, so let's also take a little bit of time to talk about him, as he is also another one of the eight princes. Sima Ying was the 16th son of Sima Yan, and since he's so far down the family tree, I'm just going to be skipping that part for this one. This makes him the younger brother of the emperor. In the year 289, a year before Sima Yan dies, Sima Ying's mother, who was a concubine in favor at the time, begged the aging emperor to grant her son, who was just 11 at the time, a title. So Sima Yan, the man who has a hard time saying no to the woman in his life, named the young Sima Ying as Chengdu Wang, or the king of Chengdu in Shu. But because of his young age, Sima Ying never left the capital to govern in his given land. He remained in the capital and grew up alongside his brother, the crown prince, and a friendship developed between the two. 
In the year 299, the now 21-year-old Chengdu Wang Sima Ying is still without a real post and spends his day hanging out with his buddy Emperor Sima Zhong. At the time, Empress Jia and many of her family members, who now held high court positions, had gotten comfortable ruling the kingdom, and their respect for the idiot emperor and the crown prince Sima Yu waned. Empress Jia openly took lovers, and one of her nephew, Jia Mi, would often try to humiliate the crown prince when they played wei qi or go together. One such time, Sima Ying was around, and he scolded Jia Mi, telling him to remember his place and that he was playing the future emperor. Bitter as Sima Ying, Jia Mi reported this incident to Empress Jia, who then thought it was best to simply remove Sima Ying from the capital. So a promotion was handed out to Sima Ying to leave the capital to defend the northern borders in Ye, since Zhao Wang Sima Lun clearly didn't want to go back and was delighted to spend his days in the capital in cohort with Empress Jia. Now we know the players, so let's dive into the event that was sparked the second round of the Eight Princes Civil War. If you remembered in episode 3, we talked about how Sima Yan originally did not want Jia Nanfeng to become his daughter-in-law, and went as far as calling her Zhong Du er Shao Zi, Chou er Duan Hei. Well, it turns out Sima Yan's predictions were more like a curse, and by the year 299, Jia Nanfeng's 28-year marriage to Sima Zhong has resulted in no sons of her own. This only exacerbated her jealous nature as she placed all her rage on the crown prince Sima Yu. Now, the last time we talked about Sima Yu, we focused on him as a child prodigy that caught the eye of his grandfather, Emperor Sima Yan, who essentially raised him. But the years after the old emperor's death has not been kind to him. Relationship between him and the empress were always tense, as he received no love from her. To make matters worse, he was educated by Sima Lun, who, as we have said, was no scholar himself, but rather a superstitious fool. So by this time, Sima Yu never developed into the next Sima Yi and was spending his days playing make-believe as a butcher slaughtering and selling meat to eunuchs in the imperial palace. Despite this, many court nobles still had high hopes for the day when Sima Yu could take over as the new emperor and restore the Sima clan and Jin to its former glory. His popularity among the court only made Empress Jia and people like Jia Mi more fearful of this crown prince. They worried that if Sima Zhong would suddenly die, Sima Yu would clean out the Jia clan after he becomes emperor. So Empress Jia devised another plot to dispose the crown prince. So in the winter of 299, Empress Jia summons the crown prince under the pretense that Emperor Sima Zhong was ill. When the crown prince arrived, he was greeted with a servant girl who offered him a plate of dates and alcohol and said the emperor was not yet well enough to receive guests and had decreed that his son to have a snack and finish the dates and alcohol while he waited to be received. Now, Sima Yu was a lightweight when it came to alcohol, but he also couldn't openly go against the emperor's decree even if he suspected it to be a fake. So he finished the dates and alcohol and became heavily intoxicated. While drunk, Empress Jia came out with a scripted letter and talked the drunk crown prince to copy it word for word. Unable to think straight, the drunk Sima Yu started copying the letter. Luckily, before he could finish, he blacks out completely, but Empress Jia quickly proceeded to finish the rest by copying Sima Yu's handwriting to the best of her abilities. She then had the letter delivered to the emperor, and the letter roughly read, I demand that the emperor and the empress abduct the throne to me and my wife, or else I shall come and take it by force. And the idiot emperor Sima Zhong bought it, and showed the letter to the court the very next day, and demanded for the head of the crown prince Sima Yu. Now, there are those in court with brains, and were not in the pocket of the empress, so they quickly defended the crown prince and demanded evidence and a debate. Fearing that an investigation would expose her, Empress Jia compromised with the court 
and offered to spare the crown prince's life, but said that his actions could not go completely unpunished, so he should be stripped of his crown prince's position and imprisoned until farther evidence can be gathered in an investigation. Unable to go against the wishes of the empress and her cohorts, the court agreed, and Sima Yu was imprisoned. In the month that followed the imprisonment, many who were loyal to the crown prince started to plan for a coup to overthrow Empress Jia, who had clearly stepped over the lines this time as she threatened the line of succession for the kingdom. These court nobles approached Sima Lun with their plan as they desperately needed his support as he controlled the military forces of the capital as the general of the left. They also believed that Sima Lun, as a member of the Sima clan, would not wish to see their clan's future end in the hand of Empress Jia, and Sima Lun quickly agreed to assist their cause. However, there was one major complication to this plan. We already know that Sima Lun was not the brightest cookie in the jar, but he relied heavily on his strategist Sun Xiu to make all of his plans for him. Now, Sun Xiu and Sima Lun shared many things together. First, they both belonged to the same cult and believed in superstition and witchcraft. They also shared a bed, as Sun Xiu was a nan chong, or a male lover for Sima Lun. Now, sexuality at the time was quite similar to ancient Greece, where people sometimes experimented with both sexes, so we can infer how much Sima Lun trusted Sun Xiu. After agreeing to aiding the coup against the empress, Sun Xiu approached Sima Lun with an amendment to the plans. Sun Xiu argued that if they moved against the empress and restored the crown prince, they stand to gain nothing, because Sima Lun has always been seen to be in cohort with the empress. The sudden change of heart would likely not be rewarded by the crown prince, and that they could easily be casted away among all of the empress's followers once Sima Yu becomes the emperor. So the best move for them is to actually first talk to the empress into killing the crown prince Sima Yu, and then use his death as a call to arm to lead the coup to dispose the empress once and for all, and then step into the vacuum in the line of succession following the death of the crown prince to perhaps become emperor himself one day. So we now know how cunning crafty and cruel Sun Xiu can be, and Sima Lun, hearing that he could become emperor himself, happily makes this amendment to the plan without informing any of the loyalists. Sun Xiu then proceeded to spread rumors that Sima Yu was planning a coup with loyalists to overthrow the empress and restore his position as crown prince to none other than Jia Mi, who always seen Sima Yu as a rival as we have seen from his attempts to humiliate the crown during his wei qi or gold matches. Jia Mi then played his role and informed the empress, who then sent her men to go to prison in an attempt to secretly poison Sima Yu. Now, Sima Yu might have wasted away his talents, but he was no fool, and he requested that he cook his own food in prison, or else he would go on a hunger strike. So seeing that they had no chance to secretly poison Sima Yu, Empress Jia's men walked into Sima Yu's cell to try to force feed him the poison. Sima Yu struggled with all his might, so the men were forced to use the pestle that was used to grind up the poison pills to brutally beat him until he died. As Sima Yu's screams echo throughout the prison, the 23-year-old child prodigy of the Sima clan dies at the hands of Empress Jia. After the news of Sima Yu's death broke, Sima Lun then proceeded to make his moves to overthrow the empress. He rallied Qi Wang, Sima Jiu, who was more than happy to help dispose Empress Jia. When we first introduced Sima Jiu, we went through his lineage as he was the son of Sima Yu and Jia Bao, who was the stepsister to the empress Jia. Much like in Cinderella, Jia Bao was the poor girl who was mistreated by her evil stepmother and the two stepsisters as they were the ones who forbid her birth mother Li Wan from rejoining the family after she was pardoned. So she instilled this hatred to her son. So on the night of April 3rd in the year 300, Sima Lun forged a royal decree and asked his men to seize control of the capital and capture all those with association to Empress Jia. 
Meanwhile, Sima Jiong cherished his role in leading a hundred men straight into the palace to slay Jia Mi and personally arrest Empress Jia. That night, Empress Jia was thrown into the same prison as the Crown Prince Sima Yu, and more than half of the court officials were killed as Sima Lun killed anyone who shared even the slightest association with Empress Jia. And many shared association with Empress Jia as she has essentially ruled for the last eight years. So in one night, Sima Lun managed to seize control of the kingdom, but also managed to drain the kingdom of many capable administrators who were unfairly killed for their association with Empress Jia. The next day, Sima Lun decreed himself as prime minister of the kingdom with the same titles, rights, and privileges granted to his father Sima Yi during the days of the kingdom of Wei. So all signs pointed to Sima Lun's desire to be just like his father and one day usurp the throne. This unsettling intention drew the ire of two fellow Sima clan members in Sima Jiong and Sima Chong. Even though Sima Jiong had aided Sima Lun on the night of the coup, he was motivated more by his hatred of Empress Jia, who has now been poisoned after her imprisonment. Sima Jiong felt like he has done his part to avenge his mother. Sima Lun also detected that Sima Jiong didn't actually support him, and soon after the coup, he handed a promotion to Sima Jiong to get him out of the capital as he was assigned to garrison Xuchang in the land of Chen. Even though it was a military assignment, Sun Xiu made sure to appoint Zhang Wu, a general loyal to Sima Lun, to be second in command in Xuchang and to act as a spy on Sima Jiong in case he makes any moves against Sima Lun. Sima Chong, on the other hand, was a different story. If we remember from the last episode, we first mentioned Sima Chong when we introduced Sima Wei to our story. Sima Chong was the 10th son of Emperor Sima Yan and was one of the three sons to receive the title of king late in Sima Yan's life as a mean to safeguard their brother Sima Zhong's throne. Being king gives him land and most importantly an army. Sima Lun's actions following the coup hinted that he was going to be even worse than Empress Jia as he has shown every intention to become emperor himself. Sima Chong, seeing himself as the last protector of the throne, pretended to be ill and excused himself from court activities. He bid his time and plotted in his residence in the capital to stop Sima Lun, and hired 700 skilled swordsmen from his given land of Huainan as an elite assassination squad to put an end to Sima Lun. Sensing that Sima Chong was avoiding court, Sun Xiu grew suspicious and suggested to Sima Lun that they offer Sima Chong a promotion to a non-military role so they can disarm him by stripping him of his army. In response, Sima Chong remained home ill and pretended to not receive the decree. This was the red flag that Sun Xiu needed to confirm his suspicions. He quickly forged an imperial decree to arrest Sima Chong. But when the guards arrived to arrest Sima Chong at his residence, Sima Chong demanded to see the imperial decree. What he saw was clearly an imperial decree authored by Sun Xiu that didn't even bother to put the emperor's seal on it. And this blatant forgery was the straw that broke the camel's back. Sima Chong's assassination squad rushed out of the compound and overpowered the guards and proceeded to dash through the streets of the capital for the imperial palace as Sima Chong knew he needed to secure the emperor first to have any chance against Sima Lun. As his men rushed the streets, Sima Lun's men responded by sealing the palace gates, which prevented Sima Chong from entering the palace. So as his swordmen fought with guards loyal to Sima Lun, he modified his plans and instead rerouted his men towards Sima Lun's residence in the capital. Now, Sima Lun had around 20,000 guards scattered throughout the capital, but none of them were a match to the elite swordsmen who took death vows to serve Sima Chong. On their warpath from the gates of the palace to Sima Lun's residence, the swordsmen of Huainan were fierce and they killed over 1,000 guards while taking very few casualties themselves. This terrorized the unorganized city guards and many fled in terror. Sima Lun and his men were forced to hunker down inside his residence and wait for reinforcements as Sima Chong's men showered the residence with crossbow boats from the early hours of the morning till noon. 
when reinforcements finally arrived, Sima Lun had survived the crossbow attack thanks to men loyal to him who sacrificed their lives by laying on top of him. Yet despite the reinforcement, the situation did not improve for Sima Lun, as Sima Chong's swordmen retained their upper hand. In what seems like Sima Lun's final hour, a group of riders holding up an imperial decree from the palace arrived on scene, galloping towards Sima Chong. They called out to Sima Chong and asked him to receive the decree from the emperor, who now officially support his armed coup to overthrow Sima Lun. Elated to finally receive official support, Sima Chong called off his bodyguards and received the eunuchs from the palace. And as he opened the decree to find a blank scroll, a dagger was plunged into his heart, ending his life at age 29. It turned out this group of eunuchs were paid off by Sima Lun's third son, Sima Qian, who was inside the palace when the gates first closed. Sensing that his father was losing outside, Sima Qian bribed the eunuchs to issue a fake decree and to assassinate Sima Chong to save his father. With Sima Chong now dead, his men quickly surrendered, and Sima Lun took revenge for his near-death experience by executing all three of Sima Chong's young sons and thousands more who shared association with Sima Chong. Now, with all the major threats eliminated or removed from the capital, Sima Lun is now ready to ascend the throne. To legitimize his claim, Sun Xiu utilized their cult to spread rumors that the heavens demanded a change to the throne and staged out a series of superstitious events that supported Sima Lun. Sima Lun then played his part in the very Chinese way of politely and humbly refusing the throne. If any of you have ever seen how Chinese people disingenuously refuse gifts or fight for the bill after a meal, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sima Lun basically wanted to give the appearance of a loyal servant to the throne while acting like everyone else is forcing him to become emperor. So at the start of the year 301, Sima Lun becomes the new emperor and places the old emperor Sima Zhong under house arrest. His eldest son, Sima Fu, becomes the new crown prince and his three other sons and Sun Xiu all assumes high court positions. To reinforce his new imperial powers and build alliances, Sima Lun issued a royal decree to promote all existing officials by one level and handed out government jobs to all those who helped him, even if they were mere servants. The massive brain drain in the capital from the latest two coups were filled by new scholars who came to the imperial exam that year, only to find out that the new emperor Sima Lun had decreed that all scholars from the age 16 to 20 shall receive an automatic passing mark and be handed out government jobs that year. While Sima Lun thought his benevolence would court him favors among the educated, scholars felt cheated and was ashamed to accept these simple jobs that were handed out to everyone. And formal court officials who had received the promotion saw no reason to celebrate as everyone was promoted by one level. The sudden influx of court officials, now numbering the tens and thousands following these decrees, caused a shortage of official hats, which at the time required a ferret or a mink tail as an accessory. So hat makers were forced to replace them with dog tails instead. So a new proverb was born called Diao Bu Zhu Go Wei Xu, which was used to mock the administration by implying that Sima Lun was the dog tail pretending to be a mink. Without the support of the people, court officials, or regional kings, this administration was doomed from the start. And soon it will end not by simple court intrigue, coup, or assassination, but rather by an all-out civil war. To find out which prince will bring an end to this madness, come back next Monday to witness the end of Sima Lun and see if the next prince proves to be any more capable. This concludes episode 5 of the 8 Princes edition of Let's Talk Lore. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to support the channel and to get notifications when new videos are released. Once again, our next episode for this series will sadly be next Monday. This weekend, we'll continue our 10 parts reform guide series with building unlock strategies and unit unlock strategies. So if you play Total War 3 Kingdoms, definitely come back for that. If you're just a fan of history, then please enjoy your weekend and come back next Monday night at 8pm as we continue this lore series. Thank you again for watching and see you next time. Bye.